This documentary began in 2014. I had no experience, no equipment, no idea what I was about to try and undertake. Just a young person with a heart for film and an even bigger heart for the Lord. My wife-to-be gave me a scripture, which inspired me to create a documentary. Before anything started, I had a dream about this shot in this place using one of these and I had no idea how this was going to happen. So how did this all happen? Join me from the beginning and discover what I learned about how to make dry bones live. The hand of the Lord was upon me. He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the voice of the Lord. I will make breath into you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, and say to it, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. For me, the story about how I came alive started when a friend of mine got born again and I saw Jesus transform his life. I wanted that same life-changing experience. Without any clue about what I was doing and what it would mean for my life, I repented from my sins, got baptized in water, experienced deliverance from demons and got baptized in the Holy Spirit. With no one around to disciple me, I looked to YouTube. Here I was amazed by what ordinary people like you and me were seeing out on the streets and I became fascinated with what God was doing all around the world. Yes. 
She has not been able to walk in five years, but she's still crying. Is that good? Yeah. Are you kidding me? You gangrene? Is it? Yeah, she gangrene. had gangrene in her spine, in her knees, and in her back. Dude, that's awesome. Did you get that? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Cool. I got most of it. I was amazed by what I saw, and I just couldn't get enough. I started realizing that there were many people doing this. It wasn't just a few, but there's a whole discipleship movement happening all around the world. All right, John here with Derek and with Matt. And Derek has uh, some neuropathy yeah. on his right side, right? That is correct. And uh, do you know what caused that, Derek? My diabetes. Diabetes, right, right. Okay. Oh, wow. So you have pain in your right side down your leg. That is correct. And what would you say your pain level is 1 through 10? 12. Oh, Ooh. perfect. You're the guy we want to meet. You really need to be delivered from that. This okay. So I'm going to let Matt. Yeah. You ready, Matt? Yeah. Where, is there kind of an epicenter or is it just the whole leg? It's usually the whole leg, but it does go down all the way to the toes and the feet. Okay, so yeah. man, just put your hand right My there on this side. Don has got Why don't you put one hand on the foot, one hand here, you know, two hands. Yeah. And Matt, command all that pain to go. Okay. Well, Father, I just want to thank you for Derek. I want to thank you for the time that we get to have here. But pain, you are not welcome in this side. You need to go now from Derek's body. You need to leave this leg now. Go back to the pit of hell. You're not welcome in this body anymore. In the name of Jesus. We want this pain to go now. We want Derek to be healed. For you love him so much. Pain, go now. Okay, just rest. Now just, for a minute, Derek. Just stand there for a minute. All right, now I want you to test it out. Be really, really honest on what your pain level is. Move it around. What happened, Derek? Oh, 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 what happened, Derek? That is, that is weird. What happened, Derek? What happened? Oh, wow. What are you feeling? That's... Oh. Is it gone, Derek? Now! <laughs> yeah! You know who did that, Derek? Ice? What did... Derek, how long you had that pain? What the... Hey, Derek? How long? You have no more pain? No. Derek, how long have you had that pain? Oh my... Holy... Yes, it's holy. It's holy Jesus. Oh, really? are, you, are you serious? Yes, Jesus did that. He's real, you know. He heals people all the time. I pray all the time, but... Derek, how long have you had this pain? About eight years. Eight are years. You, are you serious? Yes, eight Dad, we're serious. It ain't going to come so back cool. either. Are you... How's it feel? Wow. Thanks, Doc. How does it feel, Doc? I... I'm just... It's... I'll tell you how. Do you want to know how? Just pray. I'm going to tell you how, man. It's so weird. <laughs> I mean, it's so bad that even the heels of my feet have worn off because I can't even... I can't even... Why don't you walk around a little and try it out? Test it out. Test it out. Why well, I, I do, but I gotta catch my. Do you really? Yeah, that's my. Oh, well, get on your bus. Derek. Oh my God. Derek. Jesus wants to save you, man. Okay. So I am just. I want you to do this, Derek. You gotta go on a bus, right? Yes. You gotta go. Yes, but. All right, Derek. I want you to call me, and I'm gonna talk to you about it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, man. Thank you. God hey, bless you, I man. Thank God you, my you. man. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. I'm telling you, the Lord just does that stuff. Yeah, he loves you. That's why he did it because he loves you, man. Eight years. Just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There you go, brother. All right, give me a call, okay? After watching all these people on YouTube doing real life stuff, I managed to build up enough courage to start stepping out myself. 
after many failed attempts and a few small successes, I began to try to disciple my best friend and I convinced him to come out on the streets with me. This is what happened. So we're here now in Upper Hutt, New Zealand. It is currently 23 degrees. Um, yeah, so we're just going to walk around and uh, lay our hands on the sick. See what happens. Oh, who's right now? Do you want to record it? Or? Oh, is it okay for recording? It's like, we're just getting some buzzy stuff here. Yeah. Oh, he's got a sore knee. Yeah. He's got a sore knee. Did you hurt yourself? Yeah, yeah but I don't know what I did. But just yeah, is it sore? Okay. Okay. I just thank you for no pains and knee right now. Tend to the glutes muscles. Everything is building the name of Jesus. Oh, oh, Just it out. Yeah, I didn't Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, for the left leg to grow it right now, in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, that you love him and he, you're a son. And in Jesus' name, left leg grow it right now. Oh, you see that? Can you feel it? Yeah. You can feel that, right? Straight up. <laughs> I can feel it, bro. How are you doing all this stuff? Look at that. Oh, it's oh, longer now. Fuzzy. Stand up, stand up. <coughs> yeah, it's fuzzy, dude. Can you feel different? Yeah. <laughs> Straight up, dude. <laughs> I can feel a difference. <laughs> I was standing there with all these young kids healed and I knew this is the time I needed to share the gospel with them. But what is the gospel? And what must people do to be saved? I hadn't actually thought that far ahead, so I went home and began to relook at the Bible. In Acts chapter 2, you find Peter presenting the story of Jesus. When, when the disciples have been filled with the Holy Spirit and there's a huge sort of furore going on, people come around and you see what's happening. He tells the story of Jesus and declares that Jesus has been vindicated by God, although he was crucified, he was resurrected, he's the one who's poured out the Holy Spirit. And when the, the, the people hear this, this sentence, God has made him, that is Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified, it says they were cut to the heart and they said, brothers, what shall we do? Whenever the gospel, the good news, the story of Jesus is, is declared, those who declare it say there are some things that you need to do in response to the story that you've just heard, in response to the, the, the kindness that God wants to show to you, the mercy he wants to pour out to you, in response to the story of Jesus dying for our sins, in fact, it's not just a, a single response, it's, it's a kind of cluster of responses. Peter on the day of Pentecost tells them what to do. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you, if you listen carefully, you'll, you'll hear that there's, there's four things. There's the repentance, uh, there's belief or faith, there's baptism and there's the Holy Spirit. And what you see in the rest of the New Testament is that this is a really important set of responses that people are expected to make when they hear the gospel, the good news story uh, of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist came with one message. He preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus said the same thing. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. He was crucified and rose again, and once more the message was, the Messiah had to suffer and rise on the third day. 
that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. But they were told not to go just yet. To wait. Wait until they were clothed with power from on high. The moment this happened, the message was still the same. Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, preached, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. God made man in his image. God is love and he is holy. He will like No rules except don't eat from that tree. God made men and now man is sick. Death entered the world. God saw that every inclination of the human art was only evil all the time, so he regretted making man. He sent a flood to cleanse the world of unrighteousness. When the water subsided, the problem of evil still remained. It was inside man's heart. The problem is, man couldn't see it, so God introduced the law. So repentance means turning away from sin. It's no longer being satisfied with just living our everyday life as we always have. It's not just about gaining the knowledge that I do sin, and it's not just about feeling guilty about sinning, it's actually turning away from the sin. Sin is not a list of do's and don'ts. It's actually offending against the nature of God. The, the Old Testament word for repentance has the sort of emphasis of turning. Now add that to the New Testament picture of repentance, which has the idea of a change of mind leading to a change of direction. In other words, you're starting to think differently. So confession is basically coming before the Lord and saying, yes, you're, you're right about what you see and what you think of what you see in me. And I want to change my mind about it. And that is going to lead to changes in the way in which I, I, I function. That's all part of repentance of sin. As I journey through life with Him, I get to learn more and more about who I am in light of how He sees me. We first of all are, are the beloved. You know, Jesus started off His ministry with this statement that the Father made over him in Matthew 3, Behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So before Jesus engaged in any of his public ministry, he was first of all declared as a beloved Son. In other words, a Son who, is, who has allowed himself to be loved by me. He has received love. And it's only when you receive love that you can become an expression of that love to the world that desperately is crying out for that love. God knew that without His heart, you would never be able to live right. Without His Spirit, you would never have power over sin. The law was given to show man that his heart was geared towards disobedience. But God loved us. He saw the reason He made man, so He sent His Son to redeem us. Our hearts became this way because of Adam. So Jesus came to bring us back to our original created destiny. 
Jesus wasn't conceived by man. He was born by the Holy Spirit. He grew up with a different heart. And it gave him the ability to live a completely holy life. He perfectly reflected the nature of God. And it meant that loving others wasn't hard for him, even unto the point of death. Obeying God was in his nature. When he was 30 years old, he got baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And after that, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Jesus, anointed by God in the Holy Spirit and power, went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. He was crucified on the cross for our sins, yet he was righteous. Because he was without sin, he was raised to life again on the third day. He was raised for our justification. You need to come to your own realization that you cannot be free from sin without divine intervention. If you truly want to turn from sin and repent, God will immediately forgive you. He takes out that heart of stone and he gives you a new heart. The Bible never separates this moment from baptism. Jesus says, unless you are born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus also said that those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Baptism isn't a wedding game. It's now if you believe. Once you have been born from above, you become a child of God. There are two kinds of people in this world. The people that belong to Adam and the people that belong to Christ. This new tree is righteous. This new tree is holy. This new tree has been restored back to the image and likeness of God. Because of this new nature, your life begins to change from the inside out and you begin to walk out of the you that was supposed to be you from the beginning. You begin to walk out of righteousness and bear fruit unto holiness, into everlasting life. You are now a true son of God, redeemed to be like him and represent the Father to a lost and dying world. As a son, you have also become a disciple and Jesus commands you to follow him. John the Baptist says, I have come to baptize in water but he who comes after me, whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Uh, I do believe there's a difference between what the Holy Spirit does within us and what he does upon us. Uh, you look throughout the Old Testament and the Spirit of God did not yet dwell in his people because people had sinned and there was sin there. It wasn't until the blood of Jesus purified the temple that uh, the Spirit of God could dwell in there. Throughout the Old Testament, over and over, the Spirit of God would come upon people. He came upon Samson and he ripped a lion in half. Like, that's a gift of the Spirit I want, uh, lion ripping. 
And, uh, you know, he, he came upon prophets and they would prophesy or priests or kings or, or he came upon Othniel and he judged the people wisely and led them into battle. And there's, there's these moments where he would come upon someone for a, a task. And when the task was over or when that person's character was so flawed that God no longer wanted to approve of their, their task or their position, he would withdraw his spirit. Well, Jesus shows up on the scene. The spirit of God descends on him. And John the Baptist says, this is the one who's going to baptize with the spirit and, and, and power because he's like, God told me that the one on whom I see the spirit descend and remain uh, is going to be that one. So Jesus all of a sudden shows up on the scene. The spirit never left. He came upon him and he remained. I believe that in the New Testament now, there's, there's uh, this prophecy from the old, Joel saying, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, old men will dream dreams, even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. There was a promise from the Old Testament that it's not just going to be rare, random people that get this power of God upon them, but soon everybody would have the power of God on them but there are other promises that the Spirit of God would come to dwell in them. Jesus said the Spirit of God is coming. He's with you now and he will be in you. And that's in John. And at the end of John, the Spirit comes. Right after the resurrection, Jesus shows up uh, in a room. All the disciples are like, they got the doors locked. They're hiding because they're afraid the same people who killed Jesus are coming for them next. And Jesus walks into the room somehow, walks through a wall, teleports, I don't know, but he appears in the room and says, Peace be with you. And then he says, as the Father sent me, I send you. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, any commentary I've read on, on John has said that this was John's completion of everything that's set up in his gospel, which is that the Spirit was coming, they would be born again of the Spirit, all that stuff. John's pneumatology, if you will, his study, his understanding of the Spirit was a salvific one, one that, that brought inner transformation where the Spirit of God dwells in you. And so when Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit, I believe that was their born again experience where now whew, Spirit of God is dwelling within them. They're new creations. But then in Luke 24, toward the end of these 40 days that Jesus is spending with his disciples after his resurrection, he says, wait here in this city until you're clothed with power from on high. It says it again in Acts chapter one, uh, you see it in verse five, um, and then verse eight, he kind of continues this process, but he's like, don't leave Jerusalem. Don't stay in this city until you've received the gift my father promised. And he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. So yeah, they had already received the Holy Spirit like 40 days earlier within them to make them new creations. But there was still an expression of that spirit who currently dwelled in them that he wanted to be on them with power. I like to say that the spirit of God dwells in us for our sake, but he's upon us for the world's sake. It's the same thing that was happening in the Old Testament. It's always for an earthly task. And I believe just like Jesus, now that we are born again, now that we are new creations, set apart, transformed, the Spirit of God, when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, He not only comes upon us for a task, He comes upon us and He remains, just like He did with Jesus. And so we can have that abiding power, just like Jesus had when He's on His way to raise Jairus' daughter and the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of His garment. And Jesus didn't even have to be paying attention, but power went out from Him and she was healed. So that's, that's what we're called to, is to walk in that constant, daily, abiding power. And only the baptism in the Holy Spirit, as far as I can tell from Scripture, will really, truly accomplish that long term. Meet my friend named Doug. He has a YouTube channel like many others around the world, showing others what it's like to be a disciple of Jesus. Let's look at a couple days in his life and learn what it means to be a disciple today. Now, Mark, you said you have a herniated disc. Herniated disc. And it causes pain. It, yeah, and I noticed you have a little bit extra uh, hardware. Yeah, so you say that again? The nerve damage in my right. Yeah. Okay, so it's hurting right now? Yes. What's your pain level out of 10 if 10 is the worst pain? Uh, right now, today is a good day. I'm on a pain level of 7 and a half. Okay. So Asking about the pain level is for the believer to know the difference in pain before and after the laying on of hands. Okay, so so we're going to pray for you right now, and uh, and it's going to be healed right now. You ready? Okay, I'm going to You got nothing to lose. We just heal a lady that's a complete skeptic. She says, I wish, and then she ended up getting completely healed. Okay, just point at it, point, and go ahead. Notice Doug's not praying. He has prayed for many people. Right now, he's actually teaching another believer 
what they can do in Christ. Damage to be healed. Yes. All the pain to be right now in Jesus' name. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Tendons. Just say tendons, ligaments, and bones. Bones. And nerves. Be healed. Be healed. Now. Now. In the name of Jesus. All pain go. All pain go. Now. Now wait for a second. There. Now, do you feel any sensation going on? Just be very honest with us. If you feel a sensation or anything. It's feeling a little bit better. You know, okay. It's, it's, it's not as... Now, as strange as it seems, I want you to move around, and I want you to check a little bit. Okay? Better. Okay. So out of 10, what would you call it right now? I'm feeling much better. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm feeling much better. I believe you. We, we do this all the bad. time. It's not aching. It's bad right in here. Yeah. It's right in here. It's yeah, aching, yeah, yeah. aching real bad yeah. right in here. It's not aching. It's, I'm serious. Yeah. I, I believe you. So what's your pain level What's your pain level now out of 10? You know what it just dropped down from what I told you, seven and a half? Yeah. It dropped down to maybe three. three wow. Three, three, okay. So we're going to pray and now it's going to be completely gone. Thank you for Mark. God has clearly started something. So if it's not completely gone, it's good to pray again. Watch how Doug is teaching his friend to persevere. I command the Lord on the leg to be healed in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Say it directly. Back. Back. Be healed. Be healed. Pain. Go. Pain. Go. In the name of Jesus. Now. Now, just wait. There, something's happening right now. Just wait, wait, wait. Something's happening. I can still feel... Always wait for a few seconds. Let the Holy Spirit flow. Can you feel something going on? What do you What do you feel? What do you feel? I feel I feel, feel a tingle going. A tingle. Yes. Yeah, okay. Tingle. And we, did we say tingle I'm before serious. this one? Yeah. I feel a tingle. What's yes. Tingle? I know. So, right in my leg. Right yeah. Here. Yeah. So tingling is actually the Holy Spirit healing. That's what He feels like. Most people have never felt God yeah, actually heal them. Can you do the water like that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We can. Can you yeah. say finance? Yeah. That's, absolutely. That. Yeah. Finance. We're gonna We're gonna do that. But first, I want you now to I want you to change. No, but check now. Check again. Now, what's your pain level now? And just be really honest with us. You won't need that cane. The pain level is... <laughs> you don't need the cane, yeah? The pain level is gone. <laughs> you don't need okay. the cane. There's no more pain right let, here. Let me have your I'm cane. Serious. Let me have your cane. Go walk. Oh, oh right. sorry. Yeah. Right here. Right yeah. here. Sorry, sorry. Right here. right here, right here. Go ahead and walk. Right here. Yeah, go walk. Very, very good. Man. Yeah, go walk around. Very go check good. it out now. Look. <laughs> I don't need it. <laughs> I guess he doesn't need this anymore. <laughs> he doesn't need anymore. She's gonna. She's carrying it. Yeah, we know you're serious. Yeah. So listen, I have skept, I have skeptics that come on my channel and they'll say, "Oh, this isn't real." Can you say something to them right now? I am very serious because um, I was hurting very bad. Very, very. Bad. And you're standing straight now. You're not. You're not curved anymore. You're standing hurting, straight up now. I was very, very bad. Yeah. And my pain level was a seven to eight. So yeah. Was, and for day. how many years? Oh man, about ten, maybe eleven years. Ten, eleven years. And now you can you can just walk along. No pain right here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm serious. Yeah, yeah. I'm we... very serious. This is not no, I don't know these fellas. They just walk up to me and generally I'm, you know, stand up. But I'm, yeah. I'm serious. My daughter. Just... Actually, when we first said it, you were like skeptical. You gave yes, me a I'm look. Like, you you, right. you said, you looked at me like, right. yeah, right. right, right. right. Did, did he give me the skeptical you look? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm yeah. real. I'm serious. Yeah. Yeah. This is good. You know what? That's, that's a miracle. Wait, wait a second. What is that? That's a miracle. Thank that's you. That's a miracle. <laughs> He's doing a video for his wife to show everybody and how he actually really got healed. <laughs> oh, this is great. Look, they're walking away and the kids got the cane and he's all doing great. Doug's intention isn't just to heal the sick, but he's looking for a person of peace. He wants to preach the gospel, and he's wanting to make disciples. <laughs> now he knows. So to call on the name of the Lord is to trust that the, the Lord Jesus will do for me 
what he has accomplished through the cross. So he will save me, he will rescue me, he will free me, he will release me, he will transform me, because that's what he has done through the cross. When I call on his name, Jesus, I'm saying, come and save me, come and do what you have accomplished through the cross. Break the power of evil in my life. Set me free from my sin. Restore me, heal me, do all of those kind of things that are part of who you are. So I will not in any way try and redeem myself. I will not walk around with a guilty conscience. I will not allow the weight of sin to rest on me. No, because I now trust for myself that Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension have an effect for me in my life. Next comes baptism. When a person comes to that place of being able to repent, take responsibility for sin, turn away from it, when they can have that faith in God to accept what he's done on the, through Christ on the cross for us, then that full immersion baptism, and that is about washing away, cleansing the soul. It's called a, a circumcision of the soul. Those are the things that need to be achieved straight off. What we need is something that, if you like, sort of happens to us that is quite definitive. And as you read through the New Testament, particularly if you read through the book of Acts, there are a whole lot of conversion stories. What you will find, if you just go through them and make a little note of everything that's said, you will find that the baptism is a very regular common thing. They believed and they were baptized. Baptism is a bath, it's, it's a washing. And, and the New Testament talks about the sense that it's not just a physical on the body, but it's also a cleansing of our conscience. It frees us not just from, from sin, as it were, but from guilt, from shame, from condemnation. It has that cleanliness sort of aspect to it. And the second thing uh, is that the New Testament talks about it as a clean break. It's a break with the past. Paul says it quite starkly. He says, you were buried with him in baptism, that's with Christ. And you were raised with Christ through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. It speaks of coming under a new government, the government of the Lord Jesus, having a new allegiance, dying to self, living for, for God. And the New Testament expectation is that as we submit to that bath and that burial, then God responds by cleaning us up on the inside and cutting us off from the, the past. There's also the sense in which, because it is done to us in the context of the community of faith, that it's not just an individual thing. Like we said about marriage, when you get married, you're married into a larger family. Getting baptized is also part of that process of being incorporated into the body of Christ. Now, it's obviously not a magical act, in other words, you can't just grab somebody off the street and put them in the baptismal pool and say, right, now you're now a Christian. No, no, no. There has got to be, obviously, the presence of faith. And there has got to be, obviously, the presence of God. So we've gone from repentance to faith in God to baptism, washing away, cleansing our souls, circumcising our souls. And then we receive the Holy Spirit. It's not given in the text as being something that's optional. It's not something where you can say, I really accept that I'm a sinner, I've repented, I believe Jesus did what he could, I will get baptised, full immersion baptism, baptism of a believer, fantastic, but oh, I'm not so sure about the Holy Spirit. I don't know that I want to go that far. You know, the Holy Spirit is given, it's a free gift. And if you reject the Holy Spirit, who are you rejecting? So the question is, the Holy Spirit as a gift, we, we can't reject it. We must receive it. And if you receive the Holy Spirit, you're receiving the very power that raised Jesus from the dead.
Uh, I'm Doug. Dancing. I'm here with uh, Pete and Odette, and they just prayed for this gentleman. He had some extra hardware over here. What's going on? I'm like uh, able to um, turn my um, my spine, my body, or whatever. And could you I do could. that before? No. So what, what what did you have? I have uh, MS. Had MS. Had MS. Okay. So now try try going moving up and down. Oh, you did a full squat. Could you do full squats before? No. <laughs> She's going to pray for you and God's going to finish healing you. Now, strange as it seems, I want you to check for your pain. This, this is like incredible. This is incredible. <laughs> it is. How's the, wow. how the back of your legs? Because like, uh, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't even like touch basically the bottom of my foot. Yeah. With my um, um, yeah. thighs or whatever you want to call it. No, Don't I need can't. these anymore. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's called Jesus, not us. Exactly. You got that right. Amen. There we go. Thank you so much. Can you hold these for a second? Oh, you want to pray again? They have all realized that they may have found a person of peace. So they see if he's willing to go all the way with the gospel. But you know what? Your physical healing is so important to the Lord. And exactly, to us. exactly. But what's yeah. more important than anything and the greatest miracle is salvation. And it's that place of passing from death to life and coming into a relationship with, with God through what Christ has done. And it's about dying with Christ and leaving your sins behind and being raised up to new life with Jesus and becoming a new creation. And that's what it means to be saved when we actually repent of our sins, we are baptized, and then we receive the Holy Spirit. To be honest with you guys, um, I couldn't do this before. What? You're on stand with one. You can stand there with one. With one. Uh, yeah. yeah, you can do that before? I, it, when I first started, yes, but and then it got worse. But no, I I could like hold my. So you, you're starting to get healed. Yep. So let me ask you something. I know it's out there, but do you want to get baptized? Uh, yes. I think. Okay. Would you like to do that right now? Because we have a pool uh, right over here. Right now. I'm dead. I'm dead serious. It's your chance right now. This is going to change your life forever. Take me there. Let's go. Okay, let's do it. There. You know what? Life for us just stops right here for you because the Lord loves you so much. He sent us to you. And when we come out, we pray, Lord, show us a person that's willing to repent, put their faith in you, and become your child. And we pray and we look looking for a person. And it's, in the Bible, the first is a person of peace. And that's who you are today. And so everything stops for you today. It's it's us and Jesus. Yeah, so read read more. But I, I could like say, uh, welcome back. Yeah. Can you read this too? It says full uh, and it's not just the key part. Yeah, what about that? That's tiny. Oh my goodness. Look how tiny that is. Healing is a sign to encourage people to believe the gospel. Oh, the Lord's healing your eyes. Wow. The that is amazing. You I felt said my uh, fingers used to be numb and tingly, and now they're like feeling really, really good. You can feel them again? Yeah. I approached him in his, in his zimmer, in his wheelchair thing and and I said to him, you know, do you mind if we if we pray for you, what's going on? And and I said, Oh wait, but like move out of the way, there's a, a huge you? truck you don't want you getting hit and he said, Actually I'd like to get hit and he was so despondent. Just because hopeless. I did not care about my uh, life anymore because I'm like ready to give up and there is no giving up. And so what happened? You never know where people's hearts are at. Everyone needs Jesus. Before they baptize their new friend they make sure he understands repentance and what he's turning away from before he steps into this new life with Jesus. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. There are people everywhere waiting to be healed, waiting to hear the gospel, ready for salvation. For today. So repentance, the, 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 the word in the original language actually means to change the way you think. So if you've been thinking a certain way and living your life a certain way and you get up to this point and you're, you how old? 39. 39. Okay, so if you're 39, if you're 29, if you're 15, if you're 70, you live a life a certain way. Repentance is, is saying, I've been doing this the wrong way. I'm going to turn and I'm going to turn away from my sin and I'm going to turn towards God. 
and I'm going to follow him and I'm going to obey him. True repentance is changing the way you think and completely turning from what you thought was the truth to what the truth actually is. That's true repentance. And so the Lord's already done a work in you because you come from a Muslim background and you're starting to question. Nothing's happening in this mess. Nothing changes. And you've started to seek the Lord already. And so the Lord knew what you needed and he was responding to what's in your heart and by sending us. Once people have given their life to God and clothed themselves with Christ, it's always good to clean house and cast out any demons that belong to the old man, as you will see, and then baptize them in the Holy Spirit. When you go down in the water, you're going to die with Christ. When you come out of the water, you're going to rise with Christ. Based on your own faith, I baptize you into Jesus. Ready? Get one all under. Die with Christ. Rise with Christ. Christ. Based on your own, I baptize you. I believe Ready? what you say isn't as important as what you believe when you go Christ. under the water. Not everyone Jesus. has a strong Ready? reaction after baptism, but we pray as if there is a demon. And if there isn't, then we just pray for the Holy Spirit. Spirit I Not everyone you. has a strong reaction. Come out of them right now. Come out of them right now. All unclean spirits. But we pray. Right out, 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 up and out. And if there isn't, up and out, 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 up and out in the name of Jesus right now. Not everyone has a strong Come out right now. But we pray. And if there isn't, come out right now. Shady Ababa Shady Abbas, Jesus, right now. Shady Ababa Shady Abbas, Shady Abbas, Shady Abbas, Come out right now, Jesus. Just right now, by the power of Jesus. And if there is a swear on everything, it's like, oh my god, it's like you guys opened uh, my eyes up. Shady like, Ababa Wake up. And my vision is like clear. It is so awesome. And if there isn't, Doug and his friends like will then stay in contact with this person yeah. and ask them to join their fellowship. Once they begin to do like life Blair. together, they hope to take him out on the streets. Doug and, and begin his friends to disciple will then stay in contact in with this person eyes. and ask them to what join their fellowship. God's healing eyes, guys. Yeah. is like Claire. And to do life together. When I look at Jesus, I see the miracles, I see the nature of they the hope Father. To take him out that means if I'm going to be like Jesus, Doug. then I'm also going to walk in miracles and in the nature of the Father. And so what I've often seen in, in uh, just interacting with fellow believers is sometimes you get people on one end of the spectrum who are all power and no character, or I guess it's character, but it's lousy character. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got people who are like incredibly godly people, but they're just not walking in the power of God. And the awkward thing is I watch both sides look at each other and say, you're not being Christ-like. Because, you know, if you were Christ-like, you'd be walking in power. Well, if you were Christ-like, you wouldn't cheat on your wife. You know, like, it's, it's stuff like that. And, and I'm like, you know what? If Jesus is both, neither side is fully Christ-like. Uh, we have to walk in character and power to be like him in his fullness. We may think that that's an impossibility. But Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13 says that God has given some in the church to train and equip us so that we reach maturity and we reach unity in the faith until we all attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That tells me that the whole measure of the fullness of Christ is available. And until that happens, not just in my life, but in all of our lives, we all need to continue being equipped. I want my life to look like Jesus, both in word, in deed, in power and character, right? It's gotta be the whole picture. Right, so the gospel is about Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And to come alive is to be born again. To be born again is to repent, believe, be baptized in water, and receive the Holy Spirit. But that's just the bones and the tendons. What else do we need to call ourselves a Christian. I think I need to ask a few more questions and flesh this out a little bit more. One of the things that amazes me is I see, I've seen Christians who have been walking for years with God, you know, and yet despite that, they still hold offence. They can't forgive people easily and those sort of things. And, and I think sometimes we overlook the basics of the gospel, that it's simply love others, forgive, don't hold offences. And we can get tied into all this theological discussion, which is nothing's wrong with it. 
But mate, if you don't have love, you have nothing. If you're not able to forgive people, love your enemies, you know, mm, this is a cha it's a challenge. If I am to become Christ-like, if I am to truly be a new creation, a Holy Spirit-filled being, then I must learn to love with God's love. And God looks down on every human and says, you are created in my image and I love you. We're taught in John 13, 34 and 35, that the world will know that we are Jesus' disciples by the love that we have for one another. And I say it's not only the love we have for one another, but the love we also have for the world that's looking on. Maturity is increasing dependence on the person and the work of Christ. I, I really think it's that simple. I mean, take the disciples for example. You know, when, when Christ calls them and he comes and the three of the Gospels record the calling of the first disciples, come and follow me, make your fishes. I mean, these guys didn't know who Jesus was. They were a perfect picture of immaturity. They knew there was something, their hearts got tugged. They don't really understand everything he's going to do and everything he's going to be able to do for mankind, let alone for them. Uh, in their own lives, but he just has an encounter with them and sows a seed of who they could be if they followed him. Come follow me, I'll make you fishes of men. They get this sort of stirring in their heart, but they don't just, that's not where it finishes. They walk with him for a little while and then he, they find themselves at a wedding when they run out of wine and, and Jesus does his first miracle and all of a sudden they go, this guy isn't a guy that just makes my heart flatter. It's cast a vision for my life, but he's a guy that has power for, over the physical world. And so they see him turn water into wine. They go, wow, that's incredible. And then he goes into the synagogue and they say, man, he taught with authority like no one. Man, this guy doesn't just have power with the physical will, but now he can speak with authority. And then they go to Peter's mother-in-law's house and say, man, not only can he do these things, but he's got authority over sickness and it has to obey him. Then he's talking to the demoniac and the demons have to obey him. And increasingly, the same Jesus they encountered on the first day, they begin to unpack all that they have in being part of his world. And as they stick with them, as they follow him, as they pursue him, as they stay walking close with him, their revelation of who he is and what they are ultimately able to do as followers, as members of his family, as his close group, um, they find a life they never could have found anywhere else to the point where one day they're sitting down and, they, and there's 5,000 men plus women and children. They've got limited resources. They say, what are we going to do? And Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And they go, no, Jesus, you're the guy that can do it. And he says, no, you guys are the guys that can do it. And they just through faith and obedience, they begin to hand it out after Jesus has prayed for it. And sure enough, they feed everyone has had their fill with 12 baskets left over. That's a faith journey you wouldn't go on if you hadn't seen those other little things and the little steps. And I think maturity is us growing in our faith enough where we find ourselves doing things we never would have done without encountering and having an increasing revelation of who Christ is in our lives. And the only way to do that is by doing it in proximity. We've got to be close. We've got to walk close. We've got to walk tight. And I think a lot of people buy into the idea of salvation and then never nurture the seed of it. They don't live and water it daily. They don't tend it by spending time with God, embracing what we have in the Holy Spirit, a counselor, a coach that walks with us, that can speak to our, our very season or situation. We've got so many people that cross the line of faith and still come with their paper cup, uh, uh, on a Sunday and hope the preacher's going to fill it for them. But just like Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well, he said, if you only knew who I was, you would have asked for living water. And I think, you know, um, our expectation of God is determined by our revelation of God. And when we spend time with him, we begin to understand who he is, which makes us expect more, which makes us trust him more and believe in him for more things. And so we've got a God that's uh, yeah, he's that living water. Why would we wait till Sunday when we can dig a well in our own bedroom every morning and touch the heart of God? And God can speak and coach and mentor us to maturity and speak to us about our edges and challenge us about our generosity and the way that we do things, the way we relate, the way we love, the way we care for others, the way we serve the body, the way that we represent him to the world, um, empowered by his precious Holy Spirit. I think that's what maturity looks like, like going that journey. I think it's hard to strategize. It's something like, going, you know, we made it so, it's, it's such a weird concept, but discipleship is such a normal concept that we would walk close and learn from and imitate what we have learned. And uh, I think that's the lost art.
of Christianity is discipleship. Jesus sent out his first 12 disciples, two by two. Then straight after that, he sent out 72 others. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Find a person of peace, stay with this person, eating whatever they offer you for the worker deserves his wages. Go into the town and heal the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God is near. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. When you enter a town and are not welcomed, wipe the dust off your feet and move on. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God was here. I have this analogy of what the harvest itself actually looks like, and it's to do with an apple tree. When all of the apples start off, they're all green apples. Right, they're little hard green apples and they're not very tasty, very sour. And you don't pick the apples off the tree when they're green. So you're looking specifically for a, an apple on the tree that is red, that's ready to be picked, that's ready to eat. And it's juicy and sweet when you, when you bite into it. When I take that out onto the street, I can basically, everyone who rejects the message that I'm bringing or the offer to pray for people on the street, when they've said no and looked at me like I'm a loony, when they've done that, I can walk away from that experience simply saying the words green apple in my head. And I know that's not who I'm looking for today. I know I'm looking for a red apple. The red apples, when you find them, they will not only uh, engage you in conversation, they will not only let you pray for them if they have pain or some emotional need, they will, they will continue, they will soak up what you tell them about the gospel. They will be surprised at what God has just done for them from a complete stranger on the street. Uh, these, these people are the red apples. That rejection does not affect how I carry on in street ministry because I'm not afraid of meeting green apples. What I'm wanting to do is meet the red ones. I always say it's Jesus being rejected, it's not you personally. Jesus is being rejected and he warned you in his word that you would be. So don't be surprised at rejection, but simply walk away from people that reject you saying something like green apple. Deal with it, move on. You're looking for people that are hungry for the gospel. These instructions were not only to the early disciples. That model has been passed down to us. After Jesus died and rose again, he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up to heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. The disciples then went out and preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his words by the signs that accompanied it. So the life of the church, um, it's easy to use the analogy of blood. And we've heard for years, many people say the church is dying. And so if you think about that and look at a, a body which is dying, 
uh, all of its blood cells are, are no longer becoming oxygenated in the lungs. The life has been, the breath has been taken out of it, the breath being the Holy Spirit. So as the breath is taken out of the, the church, the blood turns blue and, and, and the church is dying, the body of Christ is dying. But when blood cells become oxygenated through right teaching, through correct activity on the street, uh, through correct processes of disciple making, when new disciples are made and, and we're oxygenated and, and we're all coming alive again back into that first love that we had, those red blood cells start to go around the body in the blood. And so oxygenated blood is creeping back into the church. But there's a tendency, and this happens, I believe, with probably most of the denominations that we've seen split off. They've come up with some area of truth that they will actually separate themselves from the existing church to make a new denomination. And I see this in that blood analogy is that all the red blood cells that are becoming oxygenated in the blood actually decide we're all going to jump out of the body and all us red blood cells are going to get together and we're just going to have a party because we've got the truth. And what that does is it not only brings division in the body of Christ, but it actually also removes the oxygenated blood cells from the blood, which means the church continues to die because the red blood cells are all jumping out for some new party experience and the church continues to just be left in a void, in, in, in a, a dark hole, a, a dying situation. So I see it as really important that when we get truths that are new, we don't use them as the reason to step out of the existing congregations we're in, but as oxygenated red blood cells, we need to stay in the church. We need to encourage others. We need to stir up the oxygen within the church. Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is just because we see a bit of new teaching, just because we see some new tools to use out on the street or, or we see a revival of a sort through various movies or teachings, um, those are not reasons to jump out of the church. Those are reasons to stay exactly where you're going, do exactly what you know to do now, to be the truth, to be right, to go and do stuff. And if you're then kicked out of a church because of what you're doing, accept it, go that way. But don't leap out on your own idea that you've got to go and join with a whole band that you're all doing the same thing. We've all got to stay right throughout the body. Otherwise the blood never gets reoxygenated and we don't get red blood back into the church. So what have we learnt? I landed up in Africa because God sent me on a mission to figure out what brings people from death to life. And Jesus modelled a new creation and he made it possible for us to become a new kind of people, children of God through the gospel. John said, that we know that we pass from death to life because we love one another. And Jesus said to love me is to obey his commandments. He wants us to pass from death to life and begin going into all the world and sharing the good news with others. I didn't realize that in order to finish this documentary, I personally would have to come alive to every word of Jesus All he wants from us is that we seek first his kingdom. That means we don't even have to feel like we have found it yet before we start. We just need to start seeking first his kingdom and everything else will be added to us. We are called to love others, make disciples and fulfill the Great Commission. So why live in death when you can live in life?
Our strength is absolutely in the together. That everyone has a part to play. The Bible speaks many times, Paul especially in his New Testament writings talks about the body. That actually the church is the bride, it's the body of Christ, each part playing its part. For too long we have looked to a few people, a few anointed people who have a gift or an ability or an anointing to do things. But the truth is the only way that we will see the church do what the church is meant to do when everyone plays their part. See what it is that Jesus is requiring you to do, to step out in faith. What he asks you to do in his word is what he's still asking you to do. Paul says when speaking of the body that there's certain parts that are seen that we honour but there's other parts we don't see that are worthy of greater honour. And I truly believe that if we want to be a church, the collection of humanity that call, that, that say that Jesus Christ is our Lord, if we want to reflect God to the world, which we can only do in, a, in, in His fullness together, if we want to be the mosaic that reflects an incredible God to the world, then each person needs to play their part. It doesn't matter what you do in life. It doesn't matter what your station, where you've been positioned in your career, uh, whether you're in, a, in high school, whether you are at the later years of your life. We all have a part to play in revealing Christ and bringing His kingdom to the world. All the men and women of God before us, each one and every generation, down the line of David, all existed to build us up and mature us until we all come to the unity of the faith and to a perfect man, until we all reach and are conformed into the image of the Son of God.